Hello everyone, this is Scott with Hilux Optics, back again for another episode of The Bulletin. Now today's episode is going to be a little long and winding. We'll be looking at the history of the 1903 rifle, something I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. But before that, let's look at some more recent news. Well folks, if you like firearms legislation, this has certainly been a week. While dozens of other bills are flying about on Capitol Hill, getting ready for their own schoolhouse rock slew of slogans, I'd like to make you all aware of Senate Bill 4263, otherwise known as the Federal Firearm Licensing Act. In contrast to the FFLs you may already know, this bill would require each individual person to acquire a new federal firearms license for each individual gun that they would like to purchase and renew each of those individual licenses every five years. Of course, you could be blocked from purchasing if you recently purchased firearms or ammunition. Currently, this bill has been referred to the Committee on the Judiciary. I'd prefer if 4263 does not proceed any farther than that. On to a more enjoyable topic. Our new no machining mounts are just about ready to go. We're bringing two new offerings to the table, both of which I've had far too much fun testing. For a modern change to old-fashioned rifles, we have the Winchester Lever Action Red Dot Mount. Despite the name, this mount fits just about any rifle drilled to accept the Lyman receiver sights, following the whole pattern of the Type 66 sight. If you've got two holes on the left side of your receiver, and want to mount an RMR footprint red dot, this is the part for you. Next up, my own personal favorite, the Malcolm Rimfire Mounts. If your rifle has an 11mm rail atop the receiver and a 3 8 inch dovetail under the rear sight, this kit will let you mount a Malcolm scope on your Rimfire rifle without drilling and tapping. I had way too much fun testing this setup on my Henry H001, and if anyone from the office is watching this, I'm keeping that prototype. That about wraps up the local news. After the break, the long history of the 1903. Get your popcorn ready. I've got my tea. Catch you after the break. Nineteen oh three. Say that string of numbers in the firearm community, and I can guarantee at least someone's going to know what you're talking about. So, what are we talking about? The nineteen oh three is a rifle. It's chambered typically in thirty out six. It's made of wood, metal, has a firm butt plate, and weighs a bit over eight and a half pounds, depending on the configuration. It's a bolt action rifle that has been around since you guessed it. 1903. Originally named the United States Rifle, caliber 30 6 model 1903, it's now colloquially and officially named the Springfield M1903, or 1903 for short. Way back in 1898, the United States stepped into a conflict with Spain via the Cuban War of Independence. At the time, the Spanish troops were using the M1893 Mauser to great effect. The U.S. Troops Springfield Model 1892-99 Krag Jorgensen bolt-action rifles were not as effective. In the Battle of San Juan Hill, 750 Spanish regulars delayed the advance of 15,000 U.S. troops. On the same day, not too far away, 540 Spanish regulars held off a combined force of about 8,500 troops for 10 hours. As a result, a U.S. Army Board of Investigation was commissioned. They recommended replacing the Krag. It had been in service in the U.S. military for only nine years when it was finally replaced, with a lifespan from 1894 to 1903. The Krag just couldn't handle higher pressure rounds. To top that off, the magazine was slow to load. In 1899, just after the Spanish-American War, the U.S. Army tried out a higher pressure round in the crag, but the locking lug on the bolt just couldn't handle it. They designed a stripper clip modification for the crag as well, though it was a stopgap measure to try and keep up. 
In the long development to the Springfield 1903, the military licensed and studied many Mauser components. Mauser's patented 792 by 57 cartridges were later modified into the 30-06 Springfield ammo. The Mauser G98 bolt-action rifle, known as the Gewehr 98, also provided a useful foundation. When the 1903 was finally adopted, it replaced more than the Army's Krag. It also stepped in place of the Navy's and Marines Lee Model 1895 and M1885 Remington Lee. The Springfield Model 1873 was likewise swapped out. At the end of the conflict, the Spanish troops in Cuba were made to surrender their Mauser Model 93s. Thousands of rifles were turned over to U.S. troops. Springfield Armory spent some time studying them and decided that the Model 93 design was overall superior to the Krag. At first, the newest prototype was a mix between the 1898 Krag and the 1893 Mauser. It ended up being similar to the final Mauser M92 prototype, codename Rifle No. 5, in the U.S. Army's rifle trials of 1892. This new rifle design was known as the U.S. Rifle Model 1900 30 prototype. The following year saw the next prototype, the U.S. Rifle Model 1901 30 prototype. This again combined portions of the Krag and the 1893 Mauser along with the Gewehr 98. From the Krag came the cock on opening bolt, the 30 inch barrel, the stock, and the sights. From the 1893 Mauser, the locking lugs, external claw extractor, and staggered column magazine. And from the Gewehr 98, a large safety lug was attached to the side of the bolt behind the extractor, engaging the receiver bridge to prevent the bolt from moving backwards when fired. To top it all off, the bolt handle was bent downward a bit to make operation easier. Springfield was so confident in the Model 1901 that they nearly began producing whole rifles and did actually begin manufacturing some of the parts. Unfortunately, a few more changes were needed. It had been discovered that barrels could be shortened to 24 inches. The longer 30-inch barrel offered no real ballistic advantage, but did add weight and bulkiness. By shortening the barrel to 24 inches, the military also did not have to produce both a carbine and a full-length rifle, the carbine originally being for mounted troops or cavalry. Another small change was the addition of a bayonet storage forward of the fore end of the stock. The bayonet itself would later be a point of contention. This in all became the M1903. Its first official year of production was 1903, and it was officially adopted by the Army in the same year. The Marines would adopt it later, in 1909. The U.S. government was quickly on the hook to Mauser, to the tune of $250,000, about $7.5 million today. Mauser Verk had brought and won a lawsuit against the U.S. government for the M1903's use of Mauser designs. This did nothing to stop production, though settlement on the case was delayed for years. Regardless, the federally owned Springfield Armory pumped out 80,000 of these rifles by the start of 1905. Perhaps a little too quickly, as more changes were on the way. President Theodore Roosevelt took issue with the ramrod-style bayonets then being mounted on the M1903. A new type of blade bayonet was designed, the M1905. While the M1903s were being retooled to accept the M1905 bayonet, the Armory also took the time to upgrade the rifles to the Type 1904 sights. However, in yet another twist, experiments revealed that a slight change to the ammunition could improve its performance drastically. The rifles were switched from the 30-03 220-grain case and bullet to a slightly shorter 150-grain bullet firing at 2800 FPS, about 500 feet per second faster than the 220-grain. Perhaps the biggest difference, aside from weight, was the change from round-tipped to a pointed Spitzer bullet. This new cartridge, adopted in 1906, became known as the Cartridge Ball Caliber 30 Model of 1906, M1906 Ammo, 
better known as 30-06 Springfield. The sights were changed again to accommodate the new ballistics. Around 1905, the process of star-gauging the barrels was starting to be employed by the military. This process tested the sizing tolerances of the barrel by drawing a sizing device through the bore in one-inch increments. If the barrel passed the test, it was stamped with a small star motif on the crown of the muzzle. While this gauging method was often employed to determine if rifles met sharpshooter precision standards, it was not limited to that purpose. By the time of the Pancho Villa expedition in 1916, the 1903 Springfield was standard issue for U.S. forces. Leading up to this exploratory expedition in U.S. military force, a few different alterations were making their way onto the service weapons. One occasional upgrade was the fitting of a Warner and Swayze M1908 or M1913 musket sight. Those are what we would now know as telescopic sights. The Warner and Swayze model M1908 was designed by Ambrose Swayze, a co-founder of the optical firm. It had a fixed six-power prismatic arrangement, keeping the eyepiece low and the objective above the mirage of a heated barrel. It also weighed two and a quarter pounds, being made mostly out of painted brass and bronze. The top of the scope held a brass plate stamped with adjustment and ballistic information. The scope itself mounted onto a dovetail block, offset to the left side of the receiver. This both allowed the ammo to be easily loaded without removing the scope, allowed the scope to be easily removed when needed, and enabled the rifle to maintain use of its iron sights. It came with a simple crosshair reticle and three stadia lines for bullet drop compensation. However well intended, the M1908 scope had a few design and construction issues. The lenses were easily knocked out of alignment, and the O3 has a fair amount of kick. The two plus pounds of scope hanging to one side of the rifle made the entire setup remarkably unbalanced. The eye relief was a little over an inch, so shooters had to use a protective eyepiece cushion if they wanted to avoid scope bite. The rubber eyepiece would suction onto the soldier's eye during recoil, which would not have been helpful in a firefight. Over time, the internal black coating would flake off and cover the internal lenses, which often had additional clarity issues from moisture leakage. To address these issues, the M1913 scope was entered into the field. The mounting style, offset dovetail block on the side of the rifle, stayed the same, as did the prism using shape of the scope. Now, however, the eyepiece's protective cup came with holes pre-drilled to prevent the eyeball suction problem. On top of that, the scope's power was reduced to 5.2 to improve image brightness. All other issues from the M1908 scope largely continued. Water leakage, coating flaking, lens instability, black eyes. The U.S. Army had bought 2,075 of the M1908 optics between 1909 and 1912. Conversely, the M1913 scope saw 5,730 sales to the military, though 4,200 of the scopes weren't mounted or even issued. Though rare, you can still find unused M1913 Warner & Swayze sights in their original leather cases. The Warner & Swayze optics were largely sold off or removed from U.S. rifles by the 1920s. The Marines would acquire M1903 rifles beginning in 1909. Originally, they had also requested a handful of the Warner & Swayze scopes to be sent along as well, to aid in marksmanship training. They decided not to utilize those scopes for very long, and soon switched to testing the new Winchester A5 scope, Style A, 5 power. The A5 scope was simpler in design than either of the Warner and Swayze scopes. It was a straight tube scope with externally adjusting mounts. The scope's rings would mount onto blocks that were attached to the rifle, simplifying replaceability and repair. To avoid drilling the receiver, the Marines experimented with placement of the blocks in other locations. The forward block went forward of the receiver to avoid potentially damaging the core of the rifle, though the rear did not settle down for a little while. 
In addition, the block's original straight design did not allow the scope rings to clamp tightly, causing the scope to eventually slide off the blocks. There was no self-tightening taper or cross-bolt recesses in use, yet. Initially, the blocks for the A5 scope were mounted around 6 inches apart, which made the adjustment value 6 tenths of an inch at 100 yards. The Marines continued to experiment with scope placement for their rifle competition team, eventually settling on a spacing of 7 and 2 tenths of an inch. Perfect spacing for half-inch adjustments at 100 yards. Eventually, a private sector ballistics team would develop the man Needner tapered blocks to alleviate the slippage issue. The blocks employed a slight taper to allow the scope rings to tighten to the blocks with every shot. While useful for keeping the scope on the rifle, it meant the rings had to be delicately hammered off the blocks in order to remove them. Existing scope blocks or rings were modified and replaced to switch to the new MAN system. Later on, in the spring of 1917, Needner would be contracted to drill 1,650 rifles for the Marines for use in World War I. Due to potentially anti-American remarks being made publicly, the Marines did not complete the contract with him and sought mounting equipment elsewhere. Winchester's response, the Winchester No. 2 mounts, later renamed Springfield Marine, were the basis for future externally adjusting scope mounting blocks. They followed the man designs with a few differences in taper and thickness. Around the time that the M1908 and M1913 scopes were being fitted and tested, another upgrade was on the way, the Maxim silencer. By 1907, Sir Hiram Maxim had begun trying to apply his soon-to-be patented silent firearm device to the M1903. By 1908, he had designs for a shortened barrel M1903 with a silencer attached to the muzzle end. As a side note, not long after developing this, he also had designs for the muffler now attached to the exhaust system of your car. In 1909, the Chief of Ordnance recommended against silencers, as the slow escape of hot gas would be a beacon of smoke on a cold day. On top of that, it was difficult to affix a bayonet. By 1910, a new version of the silencer had been designed to address these various issues. By all accounts, it worked quite well, reducing felt recoil and sound by about a third, functioning for hundreds of rounds sequentially, and not reducing accuracy. An added bonus, the Maxim silencer hid the flash from the muzzle, a quality noted at the time for its potential in night operations. Throughout the continued development of the Model 12 and Model 15, Maxim would insist on the silencer's use not only for guard harassment and sniping, but also for helping city-born recruits become accustomed to the sharp recoil and noise of the M1903. The military later decided to turn to 22 caliber training rifles to resolve the latter point at less expense. The Maxim Silencer Model 15 was one inch in diameter and extended seven inches past the muzzle. It had a bore of 0.375 inches to allow the 30 caliber bullet to exit cleanly. Some effort was made to pair the M1908 or M1913 Warner and Swayze sights with the Maxim silencers on the 1903 platform prior to General John Pershing's Mexican expedition against Pancho Villa. Among Pershing's command were Lingler sharpshooters, equipped with Warner and Swayze 1913 sights and the occasional Maxim silencer intended to be a field test and capability demonstration of the new sharpshooter standard. Around 1915, discussions had been taking place in the military to outfit two rifles per company with silencers and the Warner and Swayze musket sights. Through the early 1910s, however, it seemed that the military focused more on small-scale acquisitions of silencers and only a couple large purchases of sights, many of which were not ever mounted. Often these purchases were made either to test the equipment until destruction, or were intended for use in a particular conflict and were made too late for deployment. By the time the U.S. entered World War I, 
Over 800,000 of the M1903 rifles have been produced by Springfield Armory and Rock Island Arsenal. Pre-war production had been plagued with a combination of questionable metallurgy and occasional improper ammo use. The main issue was in excessive temperatures in the forging process, which burnt out the carbon and left receivers brittle. Pyrometers were installed in the forging furnaces in December of 1917 to alleviate the forging issue. This change occurred at serial number 800,000 for Springfield Armory and number 285,507 at Rock Island Arsenal. Rifles with serial numbers under these are known as low number M1903 rifles. Rifles made after this point are sometimes termed double heat treated. While much of history remarks on Germany's effective use of snipers, it's worthwhile to mention the American, British, and Canadian forces as well. Earlier in the war, Canadian forces had ordered a small quantity of Warner and Swayze M1913 sites, though handled the finishing of the mounts in their own way. Across the pond, British troops made use of the Maxim silencers so effectively as to be named Whispering Death. American sharpshooters were trained in small numbers by experienced British and Canadian sharpshooters at newly developed schools of sniping. Most of the sharpshooter rifles for the American troops were manufactured in 1916 and 1917 and only saw wider use at the very end of the war. As an interesting side note, Captain Herbert W. McBride describes effective mounting of the 1913 scope while serving as a sniper with the Canadian Army. His method was to wedge a piece of safety razor into the mount and rest it in place with salt water. Allegedly, it would fasten on so well that the armorer found it nearly impossible to remove. During the war, Maxim silencers had a competitor by the name of Moore. However, the Moore silencers were almost universally considered less effective. Still, they were being manufactured and saw some use. Supplies were short, and the military was making use of what it could. Toward the latter end of the war, the U.S. developed the Peterson device in secret. This was a special conversion kit for the 1903 rifle that allowed it to fire 30 caliber pistol cartridges in a semi-automatic mode. The rifle needed a new ejection port cut out of the left side of the receiver and stock, while the actual device replaced the bolt of the rifle. The device was essentially the action and a very short barrel of a pistol. A magazine holding 40 rounds stuck out of the O3 at a 45 degree angle and was easily replaceable. The device was designed to quickly change the M1903 to a short range pistol caliber rapid fire rifle, while allowing the rifle to be converted back with no detriment to its function, allegedly inside of 15 seconds. The Army produced around 65,000 of these devices, 6.5 million rounds of ammunition, and converted 101,775 rifles. The war ended before any were sent to Europe. Almost all of the Peterson devices were later declared surplus and destroyed in 1931. Ammunition changed again in 1926. Learning from long-range German Mauser and machine gun fire in the war, and their 792 by 57 mm cartridge, the Army switched to a 174-grain boat tail bullet in the 30-06 cartridge. This became known as Cartridge Ball Caliber 30 M1. M1 ammo became the standard for Army rifle competition teams and expert riflemen, offering greater accuracy over the M1906 variant. The M1 ammo trickled out to infantrymen and machine gun teams for general use. By the late 1930s, Changes in other armaments alleviated the need for long-range accurate machine gun fire in rifle calibers. In 1938, the Army reverted to the 30-06 cartridge with a 152-grain flat base bullet, similar to the original 30-06 ammunition. This became known as M2 Ball. Starting around 1930, the stocks on the new production M1903 rifles were changed over to the new Type C stocks. These stocks improved marksmanship capabilities, and older 1903 rifles often had their stocks changed after this point. 
The new rifles with Type-C stocks were termed M1903A1 rifles, starting around serial number 1,200,051. The markings on the rifle were unchanged, so checking the serial number may be the only way to verify an original production and not converted 1903A1 rifle with Type-C stock. Through the 30s, the Army experimented with using the 1903 to train artillery teams. A small number of 1903A1 rifles were converted to the briefly lived M1903A2 design. This was a stripped down version of the 1903 intended to be used as an artillery training piece. Perhaps a thousand or so were converted, though they were later converted back to the standard rifle configuration. Remaining 1903A2 rifles are incredibly rare. Returning briefly to the Winchester A5 scope, while the Army found the scope relatively unsuitable for field use, the Marines found the scope to be satisfactory for both their competitive teams, training grounds, and field use. In 1928, the telescope manufacturing rights were bought from Winchester by Lyman. Lyman began producing a marginally improved Lyman 5A scope, which the Marines eventually adopted in the years prior to World War II. Eventually, the M1903 saw new production through private manufacturers. Remington Arms and Smith Corona typewriter companies began production around 1941 and 1942, respectively. Remington's M1903 rifles started serial number 3 million. They were made with mothballed tooling from Rock Island Arsenal in storage since 1919. As such, the rifles were actually nearly identical to the 1919 made Rock Island rifles, at least at first. Remington began requesting changes to their production methods and parts to ease production, which the Army actually agreed to. Milled parts were replaced with stamp parts gradually. Milled parts from Remington are marked with an R. Smith Corona 1903 rifles were largely unmarked, though they did begin production with the slightly later model 1903A3. Over time, the original tooling from Rock Island wore out, and further production changes had to be made. By serial number 3,300,000 at the Remington factory, the model name would be changed from M1903A1 to M1903A3 to reflect the changes in production standards and design specifications. The new 1903A3 included a few changes from the earlier model. The rear sight was changed over to an aperture sight mounted at the rear of the receiver to accommodate M1 Garand trainees. It had a stamped and rounded cartridge follower which oddly alleviated some of the jamming problems in the earlier models by sheer coincidence and also had some components of stamped furniture. The rear sight's elevation spring did weaken over time, which caused the sight to lose its settings. The cartridge follower's switch from milled to stamped was intended to simplify production, but ended up also being functionally useful. Production standards were eased for the barrels as well, switching to a two-grooved rifling with lower spec steel alloy. The Action's alloys had similarly relaxed specifications. As the war went on, further finishing and machining standards were also dropped. The rifles with war emergency barrels shipped with a printed note stating that the reduction in grooves did not affect accuracy. No mention was made of the alloy, though it seems to have held up. Many of the 1903A3 rifles used in World War II do not have their original barrels. The primers used in the 30-06 ammo of the time were highly corrosive, and troops often did not have time or supplies to clean their weapons often enough to save the barrels. If the troops were stationed somewhere especially humid or wet, the situation did not improve. On the sniper rifle side of things, the US military didn't officially have any. Any sniper rifles left over from World War I had been disposed of. By 1942, when Allied forces invaded Guadalcanal in North Africa, the Allied forces were facing off against World War I Enfield and pattern 1914 sniper rifles. The U.S. Army's Ordnance Department, 
figured it could save time and money designing a sniper rifle based on the new 1903 A3 platform. The pressure to produce enough arms and ammunition for the front lines was strong enough that the new 1903 A4 was not marked any differently. Instead, the markings were spaced out to allow room for the optics mount to fit. It still read 1903 A3. The rear peep sight had to be removed to fit new optics, and the front blade sight was never installed on the barrel. Lastly, the bolt handle was machined to be somewhat concave, keeping it from hitting the scope tube when flipped up by scalloping out a small portion of the handle. Aside from the changes to mounted optics and bolt shape, the 1903A4 rifles were merely 1903A3 rifles that were selected for having receivers and barrels that nearly perfectly fit specifications. M1903A4 rifles of original government production come in a few serial number blocks. 3,407,088 to 3,427,087, 4,992,001 to 4,997,045, and Z4,000,000 to Z4,2920. From the A4's formal designation in February of 1943 to the end of the production project in June of 1944, 28,365 rifles were produced. Any of the A4s found to be insufficient were converted back into the 1903A3 configuration. The new Redfield scope mount removed the standard rear peep sight on the M1903A3 and fit a Weaver Model 330 or 330C scope on top. The Redfield Junior bases were marked Redfield, while the vertical clamping rings were unmarked. The Weaver 330C sight was actually a commercial optic that had appeared on the market in 1930. When the military began using it, they designated it the M73B1 and marked it as such, accepting a few hundred early A4s with the commercial 330C scope. The Weaver scope was a fixed 2.75 power scope with internal adjustments, essentially a straight tube of narrow diameter with two adjustable knobs back near the eyepiece. It sat over the top loading ejection port, which meant charging clips could not be used to load the rifle. The optic had a fairly wide field of view, around 35 yards when viewing targets 100 yards away. The glass fogged up quite often, and the adjustments could be unscrewed if rotated counterclockwise, or broken if forced clockwise, fairly easily. It was not the military's first choice in optics, though it was the one that was available at the time. Shortages and supply prioritization prevented the new 1903A4 from reaching the front lines until the end of 1943. As a further issue, the Ordnance Department's first choice in optics, the Lyman Alaskan, was not ready in time, as Lyman was unable to meet delivery requirements on the project. The Lyman Alaskan was originally designated the M73, though changes in available alloys and the initial adoption of the Weaver design M73B1 eventually led to the Alaskan being termed the M81 if it had a crosswire reticle, or M82 when made with a tapered post reticle. Springfield M1903 rifles captured by the German forces were designated Gewehr 249A. Toward the end of World War II, the Marine Corps rifle team began outfitting some of their 1903A1 rifles with an 8-power unertal scope. This adaptation of the A1 became known as the USMC Model 1941 Sniper Rifle. The unertal scope differed heavily from the earlier M73B1 and M82 scopes of the Army, with triple the magnification, increased size and weight, externally adjusting mounts, and recoil-reducing sliding of the scope tube. By keeping the same rifle and mounting system as the Winchester A5 scope, the Marines maintained mount interchangeability between their A5 and Unertal 8 power scopes, and trade at home with their expected equipment in the field. The Marines 03A1 Unertal combination was readily employed by Sniper Observer Scout Teams, otherwise known as Scout Snipers. The Marines were still using the Winchester A5 and Lyman 5A scopes at the time of the Unertal's adoption. 
The Marines also did not switch to a new rifle of the time, the Model 70, in order to keep the variety of rifles in the field somewhat simpler. This led to some confusion among ordnance depots and intelligence reports, which did not always know if they were talking about the 5A or the Unertal on the 1903A1 when mentioning the Model 1941 rifle. One additional alteration to the Unertal scope is significant to the modern CMP Civilian Marksmanship Program competitor. The scope slides under recoil, reducing the potential for reticle breakage and other problems. The Unertal scope had room for a return spring to be mounted on the scope tube, which would automatically return the scope to battery without the rifleman needing to reach up and pull the tube back manually. However, the Marines felt that sand could easily get trapped in the spring, eventually scraping and scoring the sides of the scope tube. As such, the spring was abandoned. Ingenuity eventually found other ways to simulate the spring, one of the most common being a piece of truck tire inner tube stretched between the front clamping ring and rear mount. The 1903A3 and A4 continued on in use through the Korean and Vietnam Wars alongside the USMC 1941, though their active service gradually declined. The Marines eventually declared the O3A1 unertal combination a limited standard, and recommended switching to the M1C. The last M1903 variants in military service exited around 1974. In sum total, the 1903 saw combat through the Mexican Revolution, World War I, the U.S. occupation of Haiti, the Chinese Civil War, the Second Sino-Japanese War, World War II, the Cuban Revolution, and the Vietnam War. The last 588 remaining 1903A4 rifles in military inventory were destroyed during the Clinton administration. So the next time you have an O3 rifle of any configuration in your hands, I hope you can appreciate some of the history and knowledge that went into the creation of a rifle with such a long service life. Whatever it is you happen to be shooting out there, though, I hope you have fun with it. Take it easy. <laughs>